We hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men are created. Are As a member of Congress, I get to have a lot of really interesting people in the office. Experts on what they're talking about. This is the podcast. For insights into the issues. China, bioterrorism, Medicare for all. In-depth discussions. Breaking it down into simple terms. We hold. We hold. We hold these truths. We hold these truths. With Dan Crenshaw. The eagle has landed. Whether from China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, the United States faces threats to our leadership, international order, and global and regional stability. When America doesn't lead, the vacuum is filled by someone else, and the costs are high. Foreign policy and international relations are extremely complicated and nuanced, and the reality is that a lot of our policy conversations aren't that deep. Unfortunately, today's guest has a long and distinguished career in foreign policy and national security. Ambassador John Bolton has served in various roles at the State Department as the United States Ambassador to the United Nations, and most recently as National Security Advisor. His work to ensure that America remains a global leader and doesn't back down from challenges led to an Iranian attempt to assassinate him. Ambassador Bolden, glad you're here with us. Um, maybe that's a good place to start. Why do you have uh, so much security with you? Well, the, the Iranians uh, <clears throat> took it personally when uh, the United States sent the uh, Qasem Soleimani, the head of their Quds force, mm-hmm. uh, to an early exit. And um, uh, they made threats against a number of, of Americans. I was out of the government at that point, mm-hmm. but against myself, against uh, Defense Secretary Esper, Secretary of State Pompeo, and others. Uh, and even though we've left, the, the threat actually has grown mm. uh, since, since the time. And um, I have to say, in my case, uh, President Biden authorized Secret Service protection. I'm grateful to him for that, for, the, for sure. And uh, uh, it's just one more good reason why the Iranian regime needs to uh, exit the stage. That, that's the way they behave. And, and it tells you something about the character of that regime. Yeah. That the that the Biden administration still trying to reengage to go back into the 2015 Iran nuclear deal, which was a bad deal in 2015 and hasn't gotten any yeah. better. Yeah, we we'll want to talk about that, but going back to the details of these threats, and, I, and obviously you won't tell me anything you can't tell me, but I'll ask anyway because um, I'm you know I'm always curious because obviously we get threats from crazy people. Um, the Iranian government is full of crazy people, but they've got a lot of weapons and, and potential know how. They're very you know, good at uh, a variety of things. How realistic is an assassination attempt on like a, a major U.S. official? Like, what methods would they use? How do we know that these threats are serious? How, how do we? How have we discerned and then come to the conclusion that, the, the based on whatever reporting and intelligence we have, that they're they're actually serious? Right. Well, the, in my case, I have the dubious distinction of being well well beyond internet chatter mm-hmm. uh, kinds of things. Uh, and in I would fact, assume, yeah, a. Uh, uh, an officer of the Revolutionary Guards Quds Force, this external uh, force of the uh, of the Revolutionary Guards, uh, engaged a number of people to hire a hitman, basically, uh, to uh, to assassinate me. And uh, it turned out one of his conversations was with an FBI confidential source. Hmm. Now, all of this has been revealed publicly because the Justice Department filed a criminal complaint against this Quds Force officer and made it public last summer so they could get a warrant for his Mm -hmm. arrest and and therefore go to Interpol and get an international warrant as well. So if he ever leaves Iran, we can get him. Hopefully we can grab him. But they they had discussions about uh, taking pictures of my house, taking pictures of my office. Um, They discussed a price, and I'm embarrassed and kind of irritated to say they only offered $300,000. Yeah. Uh, but the uh, FBI confidential source was willing to accept it. And, uh, you know, this went on and on and on. And uh, uh, the, the hope was to find more connections, to, to learn more about uh, what the Iranians were up to. But eventually they pulled the plug. But the, the FBI and the Justice Department felt they had enough information to, to file the criminal charges. Again, we might be getting into the territory where you can't talk about it, but again, I'll ask anyway. I mean, where, so where does he go to ask these questions? Where does this Cuts Force officer go? Does he go, like, where's the, where's the hitman chat room that you go in and you're like, so you start bidding? Well, you know, it, uh, uh, it started off, they were, they were talking about uh, uh, former administration officials and, you know, the, the lead in was, I want to write a book and would you take a picture and so on and so forth. But, but are I they guess- like on the dark web? No, I think it was right out. I think it was right out in the open. And uh, this this particular Quds Force official, Persafi is his name, was also charged just about a month ago by the government of Georgia, the country of Georgia, 
for attempting to direct an assassination of an Israeli businessman who mm. was in Georgia, and that was fortunately uh, also foiled. But this guy's been having a run of bad luck. I don't think it merits. Sounds uh, like bad skill sets too. Like he's using a, a lot of poor uh, communications. Uh, well, poor communications, uh, just generally poor trade craft. Uh, it's totally right. I mean, Thank well, goodness. It's, it's good. Yeah, it's good news <laughs> for you, right? Because I mean, if you're just like scourging the internet for hitmen, you probably don't know what you're doing. Yeah, this <laughs> is this is. Uh, but you know, they learn from their mistakes, and yeah. uh, so it's a, it's a serious problem, and it's a, it's evidence of what this government does when it doesn't get what it wants. We, we know now, this is uh, certainly public, that in the wake of the demonstrations in Iran, real significant opposition to the regime, that uh, they have sent out uh, actual uh, Revolutionary Guard personnel and intelligence service personnel into Europe and quite possibly into the United States to, uh, to attack Iranian dissidents in the mm -hmm. diaspora. So this is this is the way they operate, and uh, you know it, it should tell mm -hmm. people, especially the administration, the, the nature of the opponents they're dealing with. Yeah, no, they're dangerous, and they're and they're good at certain things. They're usually good at building surrogate networks. I've, I've always, as as somebody who's long looked at the Iranian threat network, there are things that they're good at, um, and they're more aggressive than we are. They they don't care about the risks. You know, they they, they don't care as much as we do if you get exposed, and so they're willing to take more risks. The Russians are very similar. They probably learn a lot from the Russians. Um, you know, they're, they're good at a few things. They're very bad at other things, like apparently land warfare. So that's good news for Ukraine. Right. Um, and we'll get into Ukraine. <laughs> I want to talk about that a lot as, as well. But uh, sticking to this subject, um, so, so you already had a government when the Soleimani strike happened, right. and, but they're right. still mad about it. Uh, that, you know, I guess you're kind of an Iran hawk. So they were just like, I want to kill him too. Um, but I want to talk about the Soleimani strike. I love that strike. It's one of my favorite strikes. <laughs> and... Um, because it it just didn't do what everybody was worried it would do, right? It was, oh, it's World War Three. You know, you've got, like, all the, and told the left-wing media was just melting down. Tucker Carlson, of course, same thing, because he's part of that group, just thought we're in World War Three. Are we at war? Like, what's happening? Um, and, you know, I remember going on a lot of left-wing shows at the time and saying, like, the, no, this, this reset the escalation ladder. Right, we we've reset who has escalation dominance. This is important, and I you know I think it was strategic and tactically how it happened is fascinating. Yeah, it was I won't brilliantly I won't, done. I won't tell anybody how that happened, but and we won't go into that. But I want you to talk the strategy behind it. And did you guys have conversations about the possibility of hunting down Soleimani before you left the administration? Um, you know, what, what were the conversations in, in the situation room? You know, the pros and the cons and like the what ifs and the consequences of this. How did like Give us some insight. Well, uh, any operation like this, just speaking generally, doesn't arise and uh, is disposed of in a matter of days or something like that. To do it right and under the rules of engagement that we follow, which are really incredibly civilized and intended to minimize additional casualties beyond the people that we want to go after, it takes enormous amounts of planning. Uh, it takes uh, having people on the ground establishing a pattern of life, uh, trying to find the places where uh, an attempt would be most likely to be successful, but also minimizing other, other casualties, um, and, uh, and looking for the opportunity. I mean, you can be ready to do something like this, but if the opportunity doesn't arise, uh, you're not able to take advantage of it. So it's a, it's a long process, but when it works correctly, it achieves the objective with the minimum of collateral damage. Now, in this case, to be sure, Qasem Soleimani's uh, uh, a terrorist. Uh, that, that's the only way to describe him. Uh, he directs a Quds Force operation that uh, engages in premeditated murder of innocent civilians all over the Middle East and really around the world. Mm -hmm. Responsible had, for the death of many U.S. service members in been, the Iraq War. He yeah. has been active, uh, uh, as, as the Revolutionary Guards have, uh, really since the bombing of the uh, Marine barracks in in uh, uh, in Lebanon in 1983. So this this is a very very bad actor. He was also a senior figure in the Iranian regime. Many called him a, in effect the kind of son of the Ayatollah Khamenei. So he played a even a larger role than his very senior military rank implied. Uh, and he was a, he was a brilliant field commander from their perspective. So because this guy was a terrorist, because he had ordered terrorist attacks that uh, were regarded 
uh, really as, as criminal under anybody's uh, definition of that. He was a legitimate target, uh, and uh, it was a matter of uh, legitimate self-defense by the United States and by all of our friends who helped us out with it. And there's simply no question it was justified from that point of view. Now, the point you raise about was that a provocation to Iran? Would that result in something worse? Yeah. Well, well let's give some people some historical context on what you mean by, by self-defense, right? This was the time with the, the embassy attacks, right? And this, 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 this followed along with that. Right. This is this is uh, in in the case of Iraq in particular, where Iran has been, uh, they have armed and trained Shia militia groups inside mm-hmm. Iraq who have consistently attacked uh, U.S. military positions, U.S. consulates, gone after diplomatic personnel. They've attacked other Iraqi civilians, particularly in the Kurdish areas, uh, and it's uh, it's an overall part of the Iranian effort, basically to gain control of Iraq. Mm-hmm. Uh, so he, it, this was, it was very dangerous for us and and for the government and uh, the government of Iraq, uh, and and that's part of what justified it. Um, so the the was there a risk that Iran would retaliate? Well, you could say in a way they're retaliating by trying to assassinate uh, uh, figures that they thought might be involved in the decision. But they have gone outside the bounds because this is not uh, anything that uh, that is a response in in uh, military terms. But have they done anything that uh, that truly threatens uh, a conflict, especially nuclear conflict? No. For all the bluster, mm-hmm. uh, they've resorted to acting like thugs, which is basically what they are. Uh, and I think this is a this is a good example of overcoming an inhibition where the United States is deterred by our adversaries for fear of escalation. I'd make the same point with respect to Ukraine, but, but we, we are deterred more than we deter our enemies. Yeah. And that, that's a very dangerous point. Everybody the says States. they want peace through strength, but they don't want to deal with the strength part because, yeah. you know, that actually takes a backbone. If, if the strength isn't demonstrated from time to time, yeah. people think it doesn't exist. And that causes more trouble. You know, it's a, it's a classic statement. American strength is not provocative. It's American weakness that's provocative. And, and a lot of people just don't believe that. Like, uh, you know, the isolationist wing of our own party, just, just they just straight up don't believe you. They, they, they call that a talking point. They think it's nonsense. And, um, you know, you, you had a funny way of putting it in an article I think you wrote. It was um, the Russia's unprovoked aggression against Ukraine seems an unlikely trigger to awaken long dormant strains of isolationism within the Republican Party. Uh, yeah, I agree with that. And yet it did <laughs> like it to, right. to, to, because, and, and I, I'm assuming what you mean by that is it's hard to find a more black and white issue. Cause I look, I get it. a lot of conflicts are real gray areas. I think, I think the Iraq invasion was a very much a gray area, easier to see how gray in hindsight than I, you know, I can I'm smart enough to go back in time and understand what the, that, that administration was dealing with at that time, easier in hindsight to make judgments. But Oftentimes, foreign policy decisions are full of gray areas, and look, it deserves a lot of argument. It's it's pretty hard to see in this case that we're not sure who the good guys and bad guys are. It's pretty easy to see who the good guys and bad guys are, and, and why we have an interest. Um, although I that, that that gets the isolation argument. I don't want to don't want to have the Ukraine discussion just yet. I want to want to stay on Iran. Sorry, but I, my mind wanders. Um, but back to Iran. Um, another reason they might not like you, right? <laughs> Uh, you know, you, you advocated too for the, for, well, at least it's reported, maybe you can tell us the truth. Um, but you, I believe your report is advocating for strikes against Iran when they shot down one of our drones. Right. Um, and, and so maybe explain that process and how it, how it relates to the, to the main maintenance of deterrence and escalation and kind of how you, how you thought through that particular issue. Right. Well, Iran is a threat in multiple respects. I mean, the most important threat from our point of view is their nuclear weapons program and the uh, closely related ballistic missile p- program, which would which would serve as their delivery vehicles for it, but but their efforts in the Middle East, their conventional warfare inside Iraq, Syria, and Lebanon, their support of terrorist activities, uh, Hezbollah in Lebanon, Hamas in the Gaza Strip, the Houthi rebels in Yemen, are very destabilizing and threatening to our friends and allies in uh, the region. So our presence uh, serves as a deterrent at the conventional and terrorist level, but also is important if we decide to do something about their nuclear program. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
Um, and the the uh, like Maverick did in Top Gun. Well, it's there are ways to do it. Yeah, and <laughs> and uh, if if we had if we had flyers like that, I'm sure they'd be willing to. But but uh, you know, it's it's a it's a way. It's a it should be a way of constraining an adversary. But the Iranians push the limits all the time, and they want to see how far they can go. People say, well, it was just a strike on a drone. Well, that was one of the things they had done. They had also been bombing oil tankers uh, uh, just outside the Strait of Hormuz by supplying the Houthis in Yemen with cruise missiles and drones. They had attacked civilian airports in Saudi Arabia Mm -hmm. and the United Arab Emirates. They had struck oil infrastructure in those countries, civilian targets, in other words. And uh, this was this was something where, unlike other uh, efforts they had made, where there might be a gray area, uh, our military felt that the attack on the drone in international airspace uh, was was something that deserved retaliation. And the retaliation, which I can't say specifically what it was, was proportional. It was not a huge retaliation. Mm-hmm. Um, and if we had uh, retaliated, I think it would have been a signal to the Iranians that we weren't putting up with it anymore. And what happened was Trump decided not to carry through on something he had sat through an extended National Security Council meeting that morning mm-hmm. to agree on and then tweeted what he had done. And I'm sure in Tehran they read that and said, this is unbelievable. And I think that uh, along with, with a number of other things that were going on, that led them to believe they could conduct more terrorist activity in Iraq, they could threaten the Gulf Arab states uh, more extensively, and that generally their activities in the region would go uh, unanswered. And I think that is a reason that their reaction to the Qasem Soleimani elimination was as strong as it was, because they definitely didn't accept it, although that Mm -hmm. decision had been made well before the drone issue. The decision to at least target him. Right. right? You, you can make the decision, uh, but then you have to wait for the opportunity. Yeah, and the opportunity, you know, when I started talking about this with you, I didn't really give the audience a, kind of a, a little reminder of what happened. So we basically got him while he was on a layover. <laughs> it was changing planes. Yeah, yeah he was changing yeah. planes in Baghdad, right, um, where, where obviously we have access. Uh, makes it a little easier, and so that's where it happened. Um <clears throat> But again, it came on the heels of those uh, embassy attacks, if my if my recollection is right on this. And um, so there, there was additional justification there. But the targeting had been occurring, uh, maybe just as good practice, too, as you, you're, you should always know where some of your highest adversaries are in the world. It is part of the job of our intelligence community. If the president asks at any given moment, where is this particular guy from this particular regime? Not just like their leader, but like this particular, you should know and you should be able to tell him so that there's that. Um, but it is interesting. So, I mean, did past presidents, like so under Obama, was, was Soleimani on a, some kind of target list or was this a new thing under the Trump administration? No, I think this was a, a Trump administration uh, initiative and uh, <clears throat> I think it was the right thing to do. I think mm-hmm. if you're not prepared to go after these people, they're going to continue uh, and expand their activity, mm-hmm. and that would uh, increase the risk to Americans, especially in, in Iraq, but but also our Iraqi allies and, and especially in the Kurdish regions. So the longer this goes on, the, uh, the harder it becomes to deter, because each time deterrence fails, it incentivizes the adversary to up the odds. So uh, Iran nuclear deal, Obama's big, you know, Obama's baby, um, Trump killed it, you hate it. Israelis hate it. Republicans generally hate it. Saudis hate it. Um, seems like a lot of people hate it, but the Democrats still really, really love it. What's their best argument? And then what's the counter argument? Well, their argument's based on a fallacy. So, so the, the, it's, it's <laughs> yeah. hard, hard even to explain what they think, but it, this is part of their inclination to engage in arms control agreements. Generally, we've been through this during the Cold War. Uh, that effectively uh, really didn't change the development of uh, relations between us and the Soviet Union. But the argument was if you could show to the Iranians we would accept a peaceful nuclear program and that we didn't have a hostile intent toward the regime and we got verification that they weren't building nuclear weapons, then everything would be fine and sweetness and light would break out in the Middle East and and we would go from there. Mm -hmm. The, The problem was the Iranians never gave up the strategic objective of getting deliverable nuclear weapons. They were happy, delighted to get released from international sanctions, to have 
$150 billion by many estimates, mm-hmm. unfrozen uh, from assets that we had seized, uh, and generally <laughs> enjoy an economic bonanza from the deal. But from the beginning, the deal was basically flawed because it allowed Iran to enrich uranium to reactor grade. Right. And what people don't understand, and the math sounds complicated, but the reality is when you enrich uranium from its natural state to uh, reactor grade, you have done 70% of the work, 70% mm-hmm. of the work. It's easier to get to the to next get step. To weapons grade. So there's a lot of talk about uh, this degree of enrichment, that degree of enrichment. The fatal flaw of the deal was allowing Iran any enrichment at all. Yeah, yeah, because it, it, it puts in place all the infrastructure, which is the hardest part. I mean, well, it's, it's, it's why it's your layman can't just... Yeah. No, it's a huge concession. And, uh, you know, our friends in the region, the Saudis, the Emiratis, and, and other countries around the world rightly say, <clears throat> when you license American nuclear technology for civil nuclear power facilities, the typical requirement is that the recipient country uh, gives up the right to enrich uranium, gives up the right to reprocess plutonium from the spent fuel in the reactor. And our Arab friends say, you won't even give us the right to enrich <laughs> uranium, and yet you allow the Iranians to? What, what could you possibly And you wonder why do? they're upset and, and, and hosting the Chinese. I mean, this, you know, so we're seeing a lot of kind of slaps in the face of the Biden administration from, from the Saudis lately, too. And, um, you know, it's not hard to read the tea leaves on this. It's because they're pissed about the Iran deal. Uh, this is a, you know, they're, they're not our friends in the way that like France is, you know, the, the British are our friends. They're friends for deeper cultural reasons. Um, people like this, you know, the Saudis, they're, they're transactional friends. They're, they're, they're good allies. We have a lot of mutual interest, but they will, they will go the other way if you yeah. keep screwing them. They, they are hedging their bets with <clears throat> the Saudis and the Russians. And, and it's unfortunate. It, in, in addition, of course, the Biden administration came into office essentially saying, you, you drill those evil hydrocarbons and we're going to put you out of business as soon as we can. Mm-hmm. So uh, when you add on top of that, trying to get back into the Iran nuclear deal, it's, it's no surprise at all that they're unhappy. And the Biden administration has tried to say from the beginning, we care about our allies, unlike the Republicans who don't care about their allies. But the allies most affected by the Iranian threat in the Middle East are uniformly against the deal. And, and so, you know, Obama would say, well, I mean, what option is there then? Okay, fine. Then what's your solution to stopping them from, from having a nuclear bomb? Um, so, so what is the best argument there? Well, the, the, the argument of what you do next uh, is, is one that some people find uh, hard, hard to agree to because it really involves effort. It's a lot easier to sign a deal and say that has taken care of the problem. I mean, mm-hmm. another problem with the Iran deal is that the verification mechanisms were mm-hmm. utterly inadequate. So right. I, have, I don't even have to argue that the Iranians have violated the deal, although I think they have. Um, it, it's, uh, it's, it's inherent impossible in the to deal, know. and we wouldn't know anyway. So I think what if, if the, the, the way we say this in America is that it's unacceptable for Iran to have nuclear weapons. We say it's unacceptable for North Korea to have nuclear weapons. Now, I take that to mean, if it's unacceptable, that we won't accept it. Uh, and if that's the case, that means you have to be prepared uh, either to use military force uh, if need be, to prevent them from getting a nuclear weapon or look at regime change. Now, there's a lot you can do before that, but you shouldn't blink the consequences mm-hmm. when you start down the road of sanctions. If the sanctions don't work, and in many cases they have not. If you really believe it's unacceptable for a rogue state to have nuclear weapons, you have to be prepared to take action. And this idea that you can negotiate with regimes like uh, Tehran or Pyongyang uh, really is delusional. Win- Winston Churchill once referred to the uh, uh, unteachability of mankind, that you do the same thing over and over again, and you're surprised when the result turns out badly. But that's what's happened with Iran and North Korea. We've tried to negotiate with them for 30 years, and it hasn't stopped them from getting nuclear weapons or getting very close to them. Yeah, and, and I'll try to kind of simplify your answer. It's a, it's a pressure campaign. I mean, it, that's the other option, uh, which is what the Trump administration essentially did when we revoked the, the Iran deal. It was a pressure campaign that said, like, we, we, like you, you don't... The carrot doesn't really work with these people because you're always you're always messing with us. They 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 are playing 4D chess. They, they, this is an old civilization that the the Persians that 
that really pride themselves in being able to outthink their opponent. I mean, they even have a word for it. I can't remember what the Persian word for it is, but it's it's a it's a very it's a large cultural element that they that they're very proud of. Um, you know, there it's you know, I mean, it's it was an Iraqi and Afghani culture too. We had a problem with it because it's it's okay to lie to someone. It's okay to break your 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 you know your your faith really your Islamic faith as long as it's with an infidel. And so they really believe this stuff and they're quite good at it. Um, so it's, it's, it's a lot of people don't understand that because they, they want to think like Westerners and it's, you know, you got to listen to your Israeli friends on this sometimes because they get it. They get the Middle East. They're great allies in this respect. Well, there, it's a, there's a, a term for it in diplomacy. It's called mirror imaging and it's a huge mistake we make over and over again. You're sitting across the table from somebody. You're a reasonable person. You want to find a reasonable answer mm-hmm. to a problem. You assume the person on the other side is also reasonable, wants a reasonable answer. Very frequently not true. And if you if you treat them as if they're uh, a mirror image of you, you're in trouble. Well, we, we make that mistake too, and we're we've for decades. Every president has tried to broker a deal between the Palestinians and the Israelis, and uh, the Trump administration just took a different approach. Which was, you know, I'm just going to choose a side, and that was fascinating because you know, I've been to Israel a couple times, and what you quickly learn is, look, yes, an American mind can quickly come up with a solution to this problem. And it makes sense to us. We're like, you give a little here, give a little, this seems to make sense. It just doesn't ever make sense to the people on the ground. And you're like, why is that? Because they have a thousand years, multiples of thousands of years of history. And it lives within them. It's something we don't quite understand as Americans because we're Americans, we're a young country, but other countries, and you can just, I don't know, I don't know how to describe that phenomenon, but you can see it in the people. You can certainly see it in Afghanistan. I mean, some of them thought we were Russians. Like history like really lives within them consciously. It's fascinating. And in, in these other cultures that have been around for thousands of years um, in, a, in a way that it's hard for Westerners to understand. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the <clears throat> Israeli situation is a, a good example of, uh, of, of trying to think through how you really get to the, to the right result. People said, if uh, we move the capital of uh, our embassy from, from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, the capital of Israel, the, the, pa- the Arab street will go crazy. There'll be riots, demonstrations. It's going to uh, have terrible consequences. Almost nothing happened. Uh, it wasn't completely peaceful, but almost nothing happened. And across mm-hmm. the Middle East, people accepted it. And, and look at the circumstances now where Bahrain, the United Arab Emirates, Morocco, uh, Sudan have recognized Israel. The, the Palestinians uh, have kind of pushed themselves out of the picture. And mm-hmm. the reason is because of the tectonic shifts in the political reality of, of the region, that, that the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain, and frankly, Saudi Arabia and the others, see Israel as having a closer uh, alignment with their view of the main threat, which is Iran, yeah. than they do with the United States now. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Um, all right, let's move out of the Middle East. Let's, where do I want to go? I kind of want to go to South America, but I also want to talk Ukraine. Um, let's talk Ukraine because I already brought it up earlier. Um, you know, I don't think I've ever asked you a question or, or actually or, or too much from you about about Ukraine. Um, I, I assume we think pretty similarly about it. I've done a lot of podcasts on this. Uh, where do you see, well, I'll ask you this question, where, where do you see the next few months going and h- how do you see this wrapping up if ever? Well, I don't see it wrapping up in the near term. I think, um, the Russian military performance has been pathetic. I mean, that's the only way to describe it. It was not what the United States expected. Uh, you know, in the early days, uh, military and intelligence brief, both houses of Congress, you probably sat in on them. And, and it leaked within a few days, as these briefings often do, that uh, we expected Kiev, the capital, would fall in a matter of days, and the country would probably fall in a matter of weeks. That's why mm-hmm. uh, Secretary of State Blinken offered President Zelensky uh, uh, a way out of the country, and he yeah. famously said, I don't, I don't need a ride, I need ammunition. Um, so it was, uh, it, was, it was quite a shock, and uh, it's, it's clear the Russians have vastly underperformed. They've got more territory than they did before February the 24th, but they've suffered extraordinary casualties uh, to, to get where they are. I think right now the Russians uh, probably understand that they cannot achieve on the battlefield anything like what they wanted to achieve, so that over the winter in Europe, I think uh, Putin and the Kremlin are trying to win politically and diplomatically what they failed to win militarily. They hope to break 
European resolve, especially in Germany and France. I think they hope to intimidate and break the Biden administration's resolve so that people say, you know, now it's 10 months uh, almost exactly since the war broke out, that people will say, you know, this has gone on long enough, let's turn a page. And if, if they can get that, they could get a ceasefire. The ceasefire line would become the new de facto border, mm-hmm. and Russia gets X amount of time to regroup, rearm, re-prepare yeah. to do it again. And then do it again. Right. And anyone who thinks they're not going to do it again is nuts at this point because I'm like, how many times do you have to be proven wrong? It, yeah. it, a, a lot of the people who who were almost defending uh, Putin in this case were like, no, he'll never, he's not going to do it. You know, you, you guys are sab- saber rattling, you warmongers, you neocons, whatever you are. Um, and then he did it. But not only did he do that, but he, but he, but he went for the capital, right? He went right yeah. for Kiev. So, uh, they were wrong about that. And then they were further wrong um, in the notion that us helping Ukraine at all would escalate us into a war, which it is clearly not. And I, I think shows no real signs of doing so either. It doesn't mean we shouldn't be careful about that. And there's broad agreement that that would not be in our interest. Um, but I, but unfortunately, there's not agreement uh, within the right. And this goes back to the, the statement I read from you earlier, which is like that, you know, how this somehow awakened the strains of isolationism. And I've dissected that idea for a, a lot on this podcast. Um, it almost seems to me like it's, it's, it's less out of principle and more out of just rank contrarianism. You know, we just spent a lot of time talking about the Soleimani strike. And boy, that was a pretty blatant act of aggression from the United States against, uh, against Iran. Um, and uh, a lot of people cheered that on our side. And those same people are now... Uh, and they can't even fathom that we would give any weapons to Ukraine. I think that, you know, I'm always trying to correct narratives too on like how much we actually give them. I mean, if you total it for this year, it's like almost 70 billion, but very, very, very little of that goes to Ukraine. Most of that is actually just straight into our own coffers. Um, and it's equipment, ammunition, spending. weapons, that sort of thing. Right. And we're, we're, we're actually expending, I mean, we add a dollar amount to it. So it does have a value. Um, but it is old munitions that we're, we're probably not too interested in ever using. Um, and so it's just, I mean, talk about the strategic, instead of me just rambling on, cause my audience knows what I think. So talk to us about this, like, you know, wh- how are we doing? Um, you know, let's give, give, give Biden a scorecard, give America a scorecard on, on where we are now in the world versus where we were a year ago before this. Yeah. Happened. Well, I think we failed, uh, right at the beginning by not being able to deter the Russian invasion. I mean, yeah. it, it could have uh, happened. I think I agree. The, the administration all but said the president all but said he didn't think the Russians could be deterred. The most he could do would be to punish them after the fact. Now, of course, threatened punishment as a kind of deterrence, but he didn't he didn't even seem interested in doing more to stop the invasion yeah. to begin and, with. And and let's stick on that for a second because what if Putin knew what he knows now? What if he knows that we were actually gonna give the Ukrainians all the weapons, like the just the right weapons they needed it. to Look, screw them over? Do you no, think exactly. he probably wouldn't have done it? He he didn't believe it. Why why didn't he believe it? Because in uh August of two thousand eight when the Russians invaded Georgia, we didn't respond effectively. Uh, in 2014, when the Russians invaded Crimea the first time, annexed the Crimea and took uh, a big part of the Donbass, we didn't react effectively then. Uh, and you add to that uh, what I think may have been the, the most important factor uh, recently in Putin's mind was the catastrophic withdrawal from Afghanistan yeah. in the summer you add of Add this stuff together and there's a pattern evolving. And, 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 he, and Putin and Biden met for four hours in Europe in the summer of 2021. And <laughs> Putin being a trained KGB. <laughs> He's like, this guy's easy. Yeah. <laughs> like, so this, so this you no add problem. all that together. And yeah. uh, I think Putin thought he was going to walk in and uh, he probably believed the U.S. intelligence analysis that Kiev would fall quickly in the country soon after. Uh, and, and I think... Uh, we did a lot. I mean, I do give the Ukrainians, obviously, full credit. They, they, their resolve mm. did not break, and I don't think it will break despite what Putin is doing oh, to no, them they now. Are, they are hardcore about uh, it. And our assistance, intelligence assistance, uh, about what the Russian disposition of forces was, all of the uh, 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 ammunition and weapon systems we've given them have, have really uh, brought the Russian military to its knees. Secretary of Defense Austin said probably seven or eight months ago, uh, the Russians are feeding their army into a wood chipper. Uh, and they really a, are. That's a pretty good description of it. So, you know, as long as they want to keep doing it, uh, I don't I don't. I've see heard some it. crazy statistics. I mean, like, as far as how many tanks and how many munitions they've lost, how many armored vehicles they've lost, just as a percentage of the total that they have. It's like, 
Well over half. Um, yeah, I, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not sure about those numbers, but the destruction of their uh, combat arms capability has been yeah. incredible. There's no doubt about it. But the problem is the the war is grinding Ukraine into the dust, and um, uh, the Russians have suffered a lot of casualties. There's no doubt about it. So have the Ukrainians. We, yeah. we know more about the size of the Russian casualty list than we know on the Ukrainian side, and and we also know, although we don't know the numbers, that. Uh, there have been substantial civilian casualties, yeah. and a huge amount of infrastructure and property has been grounded. Well, the, the the right dust. now, their big thing is attacking infrastructure. And, and they're, they're, they're continuing s- to do that. So people can say, well, we, we've imposed sanctions on Russia. Estimates I've seen are that Russian gross national product will decline 10% this year. Ukraine's will decline 40%. Yeah. The longer the war goes on, the greater the destruction. And that's really where I would fault the administration over the course of the period of being a day late and a dollar short in mm-hmm. delivering the new munitions, starting yeah. with the famous example. It's like they, they're barely keeping the, the Ukrainians alive. Like right. that, That's sort of the pace that it's happening. Yeah, starting with the Polish MiGs going to the Ukrainian Air Force. That should have been a no-brainer. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think this is an example of, again, the Russians deterring us, that the fear that, that Putin would say, you've escalated, now I'm going to escalate against NATO, yeah. might start a general war in Europe. What, what general war in Europe? P- Putin doesn't have the capability yeah. to do it. So by our being deterred, we've extended the war. When you extend the war, you increase the risk that the Russians might actually do better. And you're certainly imposing harsher costs on the Ukrainians who are our own allies. The, the best way to win a war if you end up in it is quickly because that minimizes the total destruction. And we're doing effectively the opposite of that. Right. And, and now, now the isolationists will say that's why we should do nothing at all. Yeah, well, let's let's take that on because I, I do think this is important. I mean, one thing the isolationists say is that we push NATO right to the border of Russia. Mm-hmm. I, I can tell you, I was there at the time. That's not what happened. When the Soviet Union collapsed and the Warsaw Pact dissolved, uh, everything was up in the air, except that countries like Poland and Hungary and Czechoslovakia came pounding on NATO's door saying, look, we were overrun by the Nazis in the 40s. We were overrun by the Soviets later in the 40s. We don't want to be overrun anymore. We want to be in NATO. We want to be part of the West. We want to be part of the alliance. And we took them in. Where you can fault NATO is in leaving gray zones between NATO's eastern border and Russia's western border. And one big gray zone is Ukraine, Belarus, and Moldova. When you leave a gray zone, you're inviting troublemaking by the Russians, and that's what they've done. George W. Bush proposed in April of 2008 bringing Ukraine and uh, Georgia into NATO on a fast track, and the Germans and the French opposed it. Four months later, the Russians invaded Georgia. I think if we had brought Ukraine into NATO back then, they never would have invaded. That's the judgment Finland and Sweden have made right. by abandoning 75 years of neutrality to ask to join NATO because they know the only real protection is to be behind a NATO border. Uh, also, it's worth noting, no serious person really thinks that Putin believes NATO's a threat. You know, they, 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 they don't practice defensive measures if NATO invades. Like, that's not, that's not what they practice behind the scenes. Um, if they thought NATO was truly a threat, why aren't they amassing troops on Finland's border right now? You know, no. if they really think they're ever going to be invaded, they don't actually think that. No, look, they wanted to join NATO. If you go back and look at what happened after the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, uh, the, the reformers just didn't get as much of the job done as they wanted to. If you look at uh, Andrei Kozarev, the first Russian foreign minister, uh, he was eager to start a process for the Russians to get closer to NATO. Uh, but but the old line communists and the KGB who were still uh, behind the scenes just never changed their stripes. But, mm-hmm. but the fact is they've never planned for defense against NATO. I, I, I was in Hungary in 1990 meeting the new Hungarian government after the fall of the Berlin Wall. And uh, the Hungarian uh, de- uh, uh, defense minister said, you know, we desperately need help from NATO, air defenses, this, that, and the other, because the only thing the Hungarian army is trained to do is slice through Austria and invade northern Italy. That's that's how they viewed uh, Europe. It was the threat they were going to make, and uh, I think Putin and his, uh, his advisors know that exactly. Yeah, and so okay, so that's one of their arguments, right? That that we're, we're the ones who caused it. So so we should so we should stay out of it. Um, you know, we can I think we can debunk that one uh, fairly certainly. 
but the, but the other argument they make is it's just it doesn't affect us. Like so, what's why? Why do we? Why do we care? Like why not just stay neutral? Uh, we can be Switzerland. We can just we can you know America first. We can focus here, and then everything will just work out better. Yeah. Well, uh, that that rejects the lesson of the 20th century that in in particularly looking at Europe, peace and stability in Europe are a vital American national interest in terms of our trade, uh, in terms of our own security. Uh, it's true that Ukraine is not a NATO member, although, as I say, if it could have been, but it borders on key NATO countries like Poland, Romania, who are desperately afraid, as are the Baltics, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, that, that they're going to be next. And what effect is it having on us? Look, this is helping to precipitate rece recession in Europe. It'll have a negative economic impact on the United States. Uh, and beyond that, other countries are watching what our reaction is and what the reaction of the West is to land war in Europe of a size not seen since 1945. And the place they're watching it uh, most carefully is Beijing. Mm -hmm. Because if the West, and particularly the United States, can't defend a European country against unprovoked aggression, what are we going to do when the Chinese go after Taiwan or the right. Senkaku Islands or South China Sea or land borders with Vietnam and India? People look to see whether the United States, which is the leader of uh, the free world, it still is, whether we have the resolve and the capability to defend our interests and our friends. We're not doing this out of charity. We're doing it because it directly affects us here in America. And if you can't see that, really, you need remedial reading. <laughs> yeah, there's a, there's a lot of history that, it would, that would indicate that um, aggression left unchecked leads to more aggression. Now, some people just can't comprehend that because they just don't believe that people are that evil or that territorial or that imperialist, whatever it is. Um, but it just seems to happen every single time. Um, and there's no reason to think it wouldn't in, in this case either. Um, but, but there was an important lesson to kind of extract from a lot of that conversation, which is it brings back like my original question. What, what if Putin knew then what he knows now? That, that we would give you basically, um, would give Ukrainians basically unlimited stingers, basically give them the, the high Mars, which is the long range artillery that they need to really keep the Russians back and just stop this war machine. Um, you know, the, the economic toll, all of it, but we didn't tell him, you know, we didn't tell him back then because we ourselves weren't sure. And so it, of course, it begs the question, why not actually start with that? And, and deter, say, we are going to do X, Y, and Z. China, if you invade Taiwan, you can rest assured that there will be just unlimited amount of arms and, and whatever is needed sent there, uh, either ahead of time or during. Uh, we'll send our submarines. We'll make sure that you don't have access. It, it, that's what's going to happen, and it will be absolute hell for you. So just don't do it. Um, and as opposed to this kind of wishy-washiness that, that we impose upon ourselves. Yeah, well, <clears throat> there are times when ambiguity um, uh, can be helpful. That's the doctrine that uh, Kissinger came up with for Taiwan, strategic ambiguity. You know, it's one thing if well, you've that's got... that's another good question. Is that still yeah, the right you, thing right now? If you've got Henry Kissinger managing strategic ambiguity, then, then, then we might be able to do it. But there are also... <laughs> there are also we don't, we're a little short on Henry Kissinger's these days. But it's also the case that ambiguity can increase the risk of war because the adversary miscalculates what your resolve is. And in the case of Taiwan, I think we're long past the point where we should say uh, we do have an unequivocal commitment to defend the island. Now, that does not mean, as some of the isolationists say, that we're putting our foreign policy in the hands of another country. That, that's not how it works. When we make that kind of commitment, our relationship with the country involved, Taiwan, Ukraine, whomever it might be, gets a lot closer, and our policies get more aligned, and that benefits us in many, many other respects, too. Yeah, and, and, and going back to the benefits, and what's our status in the world right now, I I argue to people, you know, we're a lot better off than we were um, a year ago, just geostrategically speaking, and for, for, for quite a few reasons. And we have spent some money, um, We've spent, you know, when it all when it's all said and done. I mean, you're looking at if if, if you really want to add a bunch of numbers together, I think it disingenuously maybe up to five percent of of defense spend annual defense spending. Okay, and that's our investment here. 
that's not a lot of money in the grand scheme of things. Um, and what have we gotten for it? So you've gotten a, a Russian war machine that's going through the wood chipper. Uh, that seems to be a good thing because we are rightfully worried that they, if, if, if they were easily, if they easily took Kiev, which we all thought they would, they wouldn't have lost anything. They'd still have somewhat of a war machine. They would have learned some lessons and they'd be emboldened. They would think, you know what? These, nobody in the West has the guts to stand up to us. We've always wanted some of these Baltic countries. I mean, we have Russian territory just on the other side. I mean, wouldn't it be nice if there was a land bridge between us and that Russia? That would be great. You know, why not? And they'd probably do some you know, kind of irregular warfare type stuff. Maybe start off with some cyber attacks, maybe some cyber attacks that have physical damages to see what we do. They'd keep testing us and we'd keep failing that test and boom. And all of a sudden somebody triggers article five and you're in an actual war because you didn't want to be one because you were so afraid of being in one in the first place that you end up in one um, and probably a worst one and with a stronger Russia than you otherwise would have. But now you've got a Europe that's actually pretty united. You've got more promises of, of increased defense spending. I think the Germans just announced they're kind of cutting back on that. So we've got we to be stronger with them. But most other countries are, are, are on the up and up. Um, you've got a pretty wide agreement, it seems, with us and our allies that China is a bad guy. And I don't know that that agreement was really there before. It seems to be much more it's so growing. now. I think, I, think it's, I think it's greater now than it was before. I think we still have a lot to learn about the nature of the threat, and I think people need to get educated on it. And it's one reason I'd say in the 2024 election uh, that this is a good time to talk to the American people about the threat of China and what it's going to require to protect ourselves from them. People understand that if they cut off the supply chain on iPhones, that has a direct impact. There are a lot of other impacts as well. We've become too dependent on China in very uh, high-tech areas. Uh, but, but their threat is widespread, and, uh, and, and we, we need to understand it better. Yeah, we do. Um, in the new Congress, there'll be a, a select committee that, direct, that deals directly with China. I think that'll be a good thing. It'll be interesting to see where Democrats will work with us on. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, hard to, <laughs> it's hard to tell these days. So partisanship sometimes runs so deep that people just... If the other side agrees with it, I have to disagree with it. Again, I think a lot of our right-wing isolationists, I don't think that comes from a place of principle on the Ukraine-Russia issue. I think it's because, the, you know, everybody's saying it's the thing, so I don't want to be for it. Like, I, I really think it's unfortunately that simple. Uh, Democrats are very similar sometimes. So when I go and ask Democrats, hey, will you get on this bill that directly targets the Mexican drug cartels? You know, puts them in the category, uh, a certain their own kind of category, that allows us to target them financially, uh, target them with additional uh, and law enforcement tools, increases penalties, uh, allows us to put sanctions on Mexican government officials that, that aid and abet them. Can we at least agree on that? You know, because they're putting fentanyl into our into our system, yeah, killing which, tens which of thousands of people. Comes from China. I mean, it's, yeah, uh, by the, the Chinese way, are also doing the same across the Mexican border. Yeah. Like, can we focus on that? And I and I still don't get eager yeses. Um, I actually haven't gotten one yes just yet. And so that is, that is extremely concerning. Um, and so I, I, the, the, the need to make everything partisan, um, uh, is, is, is a bad thing. You know, I, I applauded Pelosi for going to Taiwan in, in the face of threats, but Biden's administration basically undercut her as she went said, Oh, it's not a great idea. It, it was, it was a, more of a signal of weakness from Biden himself. I mean, I think part of the problem is that the democratic party, doesn't have a Scoop Jackson wing anymore, of strong believers in national security. This is not the party of Harry Truman. It's not the party of Joe Lieberman anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's not good for the country. So uh, I'd like to see a much stronger uh, security view on the Democratic side, but it's also why when isolationism gets loose within the Republican Party, I think it's a concern because if we grow weak, then you've got both parties without yeah. the strong national security wings. Well, it, it has been weird to see the Democrats united on the Ukraine cause. Actually, I, I can't even explain that one. <laughs> so maybe. Well, I think it's a. I think it's partially a Trump distortion that yeah. uh, that that uh, they wanted to show they were tough on Russia because they believed the Russia collusion during the 2016 election, uh, of which there's been no, no evidence. But the fact was, during the Cold War, it was the Democrats who were the weakest on the Soviet Union. It's a strange reversal. Yeah, maybe we'll, and we'll, uh, what time are we at? We're almost at an hour. So um, I, I do want to talk about South America. It's kind of left out of the conversation a lot. And uh, it's, it's, it's a direction I want to point us into a lot more because 
there's clear and present dangers all over the world. Some of these I would describe more as strategic issues. China is a, a strategic competitor, a strategic danger. Uh, Russia the same way. Um, the Mexican cartels are, are right up on our border and they're facilitating an immigration crisis, which is, you know, it's, it's dangerous in many ways. It's mostly a violation of our sovereignty. It's a violation of just basic rule of law, which is, is frustrating in and of itself. At least with a lot of other problems, of course, the, it's the ease to do human trafficking it makes it easier to do drug smuggling. Um, and you know, a lot of Americans can deal with, with drugs because a lot of Americans like to take the drugs, let's be honest. But they don't necessarily want fentanyl lacing those drugs and then killing them. Um, and so I think there's a game changer here. And you've, you've got, I mean, what do you think of the state of Mexico right now? Uh, as well, far as a failed narco state, where, where is it? Where are we at? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's uh, civil stability is very much threatened. And th this goes back to the, to the understanding uh, that I think people saw uh, beginning back in the Obama administration, but didn't do anything about that the drug cartels were in many respects running more of the country than the government in Mexico City was. And I think uh, Lopez Obrador, the, the incumbent president there, I don't, I don't know how his attitude derives the way it does, but he's giving more comfort to the drug cartels and making it harder for us to cooperate on uh, counter-narcotics efforts than, than in a long, long time. And it's not just that. As you point out, it, the immigration question, the threat of terrorists coming across the southern border, carrying biological, chemical, or even dismantled nuclear weapons that they bring in and reconstruct in American cities. Uh, every American president comes in and says, I'm going to pay more attention to the Western Hemisphere, and nobody does it. Nobody. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, beyond Mexico, you've got what I call the troika of tyranny uh, in the Trump administration, Cuba, Venezuela, and Nicaragua. And they are threats to us not merely because of the activities of their governments, but because of the presence of Russian and Chinese mm -hmm. military and commercial interest. Uh, the Russians, especially in Cuba, we see Chinese there now, both of them, heavily in Venezuela, um, and uh, it, it's a base for them economically and politically to undercut our position in the hemisphere. And when you see many of the governments, we've just seen it in uh, Brazil, move to the left, mm -hmm. uh, the entire hemisphere is endangered. And, and again, we just don't pay enough attention. Yeah, saw it in Colombia recently too with their recent election. That, that was another setback. Yes, it's it's a big one because I mean because that, that's a place of a lot of success. Uh, that's a place where we've had a ton of success over the last couple of decades. I mean, you look at Mexico now; it seems pretty similar to Colombia in the '90s. Right. Uh, this and, I, and nobody in this administration wants to talk about it. And I've noticed that when I approach Democrats about it, um, they they're immediately hands off because oh, you know, it's a border issue. I'm like, like it's more than just the border issue. You know, I mean, it, try, try to think straight on this, please, for, for one second. Um, look, I, I'm still holding out hope. <laughs> I, I'm still holding out hope that we can that we can build a coalition here that at least targets the cartels. I, I think it's I think it's enormously necessary. And I would say politically unifying if you just let it be. Well, it, it's the, the, the consequences of the cartel's activity are most harmful to the poorer sectors of the country. And uh, that should be something we can unite on. And I think the potential threat of having our borders uh, being porous for adversaries from outside the hemisphere ought to get people's attention. It should. And again, it's politically unifying. You know, the same people from the right who call you and me warmongers and neocons and whatever. Um, I'll tell you what, I think they, they'd be on board. With a with a counter a counter narco uh, sort of policy. Yeah. Well, look, I think in the national security field generally, more bipartisanship would help the country. I think, in particular, over the next couple of years, although it looks like we're having pretty good success on the defense budget this this year, mm -hmm. it's still way below what it needs to be. And at mm -hmm. a time when when we as Republicans do think national spending as a whole needs to come down, we re need to reduce the deficit. There are some hard questions on getting that domestic spending down, although I, I would say repeal the, the badly named Inflation Reduction Act and take that money off the table, spend part of it on defense, we would still save a lot. Yeah. But, but we, we face threats across the national security spectrum. We've talked about a lot of them here. And that means to protect yourself, you have to have more investment uh, with the weapons and other systems you need. And that's, that's just going to take more money. 
take more money and uh, some creativity too, I think, especially with, with the China problem. Um, do you think we're at least on the right track on that? That's my last question to you that I know you got. Yeah, look, I think we're coming from behind on China. I think we learned late. I think we've uh, caught up a lot. Uh, but the China threat, uh, to me, is the existential threat of the 21st century, and it is whole of society, economic, political, military, cultural. Um, and uh, dealing with it is going to take a lot of effort, and uh, it is going to take... Uh, I think, more uh, political cooperation in our country. If we're divided, uh, the Chinese will take advantage of it. There's no doubt about it. And if you look at uh, Russian efforts beginning in 2016 to sow discord and lack of faith in our fundamental institutions, Chinese are way ahead of them. Mm-hmm. And, and they just have a, they have a numbers advantage, right? They don't need, they don't need to train up a bunch of people in, in specific skill sets, which I think we get wrapped around a lot, you know, whether it's in the intelligence community or the military, whatever it is. They just throw 100,000 people at a problem. You know, do this, do this basic thing. Um, and it's, it's just it's the sheer volume of it is, 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 is kind of terrifying, whether it's collection or whether it's disinformation. Um, and then about, while simultaneously making it impossible for us to do the same to them. Uh, because they keep such they, they keep such a tight control over their people. But do you see cracks in that? I mean, you know, I've, I've had other interesting uh, thinkers on this podcast, like Peter Zion, who's who who would argue, look, their demographics are so bad. They're the they the, the fact that they've put out so many bad loans that they're over leveraged to such an extreme extent that you, you couldn't even calculate their debt to GDP ratio. Um, but they don't have a lot longer to hang on. That there's some kind of imminent, maybe not collapse, but certainly decline. Is that, is that factor in at all to how we should think about it? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think that's largely accurate. And I think Xi Jinping's consolidation of economic as well as political power in the center will reduce their economic growth, which will put more pressure on the system. That's, that's part of the theory that says Taiwan is vulnerable in the short term, that uh, in classic authoritarian style, if you've got a domestic problem, you divert people's attention by creating a foreign crisis. So I do think that's real. But I think as we can see from the demonstrations uh, over the past several weeks, triggered by COVID and the zero COVID policy, but also reflecting when the university students hold up the blank pieces of paper that Mm -hmm. represent what they can't say, Mm -hmm. uh, the spirit of Hong Kong is still alive inside China. uh, And, you know, if we had a more Uh, effective and assertive uh, government information program, if we had Mm -hmm. radios and and other mechanisms to get into China, we we could cause some uh, real turmoil there by talking to the people of China more directly. And I I think that's something we need, uh, certainly for China, but in other places in the world, too. That that, that brings up a big point. I mean, psych warfare, information warfare, it it, means it's in the old school days, it's it's dropping leaflets on villages. We kind of still did that uh, somewhat recently giving them the American message like this, this is who we are. You know, uh, we have a, what was it called? A um, voice of America. Yeah. We have radio free Asia. We have, we have a number of things like that. They're vastly underfunded. Mm-hmm. They've been the subject of partisan warfare. And they're not aggressive, country. right? Because it's they're, like, wait, do we put out some woke message about intersectionality yeah, or do we put out America's awesome? Yeah. This is, like, you can be objective and still be pro American. I mean, I right. think that's the basic point, but we've, we have not for decades integrated the information state craft into overall national strategy. And that's a huge failure. It's a big part of China's strategy, influence operations, overt and covert, uh, as with the Russians as well. And we're way behind on that. Um, yeah, you'd actually written before, sorry, this is the last question, I promise. Um, how, how we're, we're never, we never quite get it quite right with uh, sanctions policy that um, they're, they're, it's usually virtue signaling and it's not really hitting where it needs to hit. We talk about sanctions all the time. You know, most people have, they think just sanctions. Okay, we sanctioned it. Um, but obviously it's more complicated than that. Uh, is there is there a set of solutions um, to that problem or is it just hiring the right people to design the sanctions properly? Well, I think that's part of it, but I think a lot of it uh, could stand a very thorough review. <clears throat> the more effective sanctions are, uh, the less likely it is you have to use military force. This w- Woodrow Wilson was the great proponent of economic sanctions because he didn't want to use military means. But if the economic sanctions don't produce the result you want, you're actually bringing the use of military force closer. So I would think the liberals ought to be in agreement here that if we can find ways to make these sanctions bite more effectively and get what we want, uh, that ought to be a a, a real priority. I think so. 
John Bolton, thank you so much for uh, for being here. It's been a fascinating discussion. I think we learned a lot. I appreciate you. Glad Thanks to be for with your you. Service.